modern masterpiece. At home in the deep woods, taking four years to complete, it became the man-made link that connects the divided state of Michigan. Now, the Mackinac Bridge on Modern Marvels. Completion in 1957, it was the longest single span suspension bridge on Earth. But unlike its record breaking predecessors, it doesn't support the chaotic hustle and bustle of New York City. Nor does it stand at the gateway to California's golden promised land. The Mackinac Bridge could be the engineering and architectural jewel of any major metropolis. Instead, it connects two small Michigan towns. Mackinac City and St. Ignace. From an engineering standpoint, the Mackinac Bridge is unique, but when I look at the bridge, it's simply a magnificent structure. The bridge is graceful to look at and be around. It is the icon of Michigan. It's interesting that it's so far away from any major metropolitan area. It's 400 miles from Chicago and nearly 300 miles from uh, Detroit. Separated by Lakes Michigan and Huron, the state of Michigan is really two peninsulas that come closest together in the five-mile-wide Mackinac Straits. The word Mackinac is derived from the Native American name for the region, Michilimackinac, which many translate as Land of the Great Turtle. The peculiar spelling of Mackinac, which ends in an A-C, is often attributed to early French settlers. The bridge is the only physical connection between Michigan's pastoral northern mainland and heavily forested Upper Peninsula. It stands strong against some of the harshest weather and natural conditions found anywhere in the United States. Very stormy days, extreme amount of winds, a lot of environmental conditions in the Straits of Mackinac, both high temperature changes in the wintertime. We record temperatures well below zero. And in the summertime, temperatures can rise as much as 100 degrees. At nearly five miles, the structure is really many bridges combined to make one. Roughly 30 small backspan bridges attached to the main and most visually stunning part of the span, the suspension bridge. Strung between a pair of colossal anchorages and over two 552-foot towers, from end to end, it stretches an amazing 8,614 feet. Suspension bridges are unique in both design and construction. While other spans rely on simple supports or the uplifting forces exerted by cantilevers, suspension bridges hang from two main cables strung over towers and secured at anchorage points. The design allows the bridge to be both incredibly strong and deceivingly flexible. The Mackinac Bridge is a very fluid, very moving bridge. Uh, it is designed to be that way. It is not fixed. It is not solid. In a high wind, the bridge will rotate to the east or to the west up to 35 feet. It will move up and down 10 feet by temperature alone. The towers will actually move in toward each other 10 to 15 feet. Though unnoticed by most motorists, the key to the bridge's flexibility lies on the roadway. Here we are on the roadway surface of the bridge near the expansion joint assembly at the South Tower. Designed to expand and contract with changes in temperature, changes in wind pressure, and loading of vehicles that go across the structure, mainly trucks. As the bridge expands and contracts, the remainder of the structure also rises and falls. But there's one feature of the bridge no motorist can miss. The two center lanes are built of open steel grates. It is an open surface that uh, you can see right through. If anyone were afraid of heights, they might have problems walking around on the open grating because it's about 150 feet down to the water surface. This isn't meant to torture acrophobes, but is actually an ingenious design feature of the bridge. Winds off the Great Lakes have been clocked at over 100 miles per hour. Instead of catching it like a sail, the aerodynamic road surface allows the wind to harmlessly flow through. 
the combination of open roadway, low side railing and slender suspension cables gives the structure a very airy feel. For some, crossing the bridge can feel like flying. For others, it's a bit overwhelming. The Bridge Authority runs a driver's assistance program. Once or twice a day, bridge workers take the wheel from frightened motorists and taxi them across. But for almost everyone else, the bridge has become a cherished part of the landscape. The economic prosperity gained by connecting the local communities and the simple convenience the bridge offers has forever changed the state of Michigan. Just as the first bridge backers envisioned it would in the late 1800s. In the 1880s, when the uh, Brooklyn Bridge opened up in New York, and a grocer, of all people, and around the uh, Straits area, uh, got the idea of uh, publishing a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge on his grocery bags, and he superimposed it with the state of Michigan. And a lot of people started talking about the possibility of building a bridge at that point in time. But that talk didn't become serious until the introduction of the automobile, and subsequent road construction increased access into the Upper Peninsula. In 1923, the state began running ferries across the Straits of Mackinac. But harsh weather hindered the boat's passage most of the year. The only other option for motorists who wanted to get from the lower to the upper peninsula was an over 30-hour four-state odyssey around the shores of Lake Michigan. By the 1930s, local businessmen realized a bridge was necessary if the area was to grow financially. For years, the bridge had been a political football, kicked around between the two major parties as to who would get the credit for building it. But the governor, Governor G. Menon Williams, to his everlasting credit, appointed an authority of six men who were above the politics. The chairman, everybody agreed, would be Prentice M. Brown, who had been a United States senator, and uh, at that time was chairman of the Detroit Edison Company. Everyone involved realized finding money would be difficult. Some engineers claimed that given the crushing winter ice and gale force winds of spring and fall, no bridge could be built to withstand the harsh conditions. Even if it could be built, it most definitely would experience construction delays during the winter months because of the frozen straits and the potential source of bridge revenue, traffic, was erratic at best. During holidays or at the beginning or end of hunting season, ferry passengers could wait 19 hours. But most of the year, traffic was extremely light. The head of the bridge authority understood the problems all too well. My dad, Prentice Brown, had good connections with the markets in, in Michigan and New York, and he knew getting $100 million, which was the estimated cost, would be a problem. The legislature said, no way is the state going to back this thing. But they may pass legislation to allow the authority to go out and raise these funds without the full faith and credit of Michigan. In 1950, the state of Michigan authorized the Bridge Authority to try to sell their idea to the American public. Hat in hand and with almost no backing, the first thing they needed was a plan, or a set of plans. Fortunately for them, a bridge designing superstar had been eyeing the Straits for nearly 20 years. Having designed over 400 projects, Dr. David B. Steinman was eager to make the bridge his own. He was an engineer who owned his own firm in New York. At just over five feet tall, he was larger than life and exactly what the bridge authority needed. As a boy, he had been brought up in the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge and knew early on that uh, he was going to dedicate his life to bridge designing. At least he told me that. He was small, but a booming voice. If he had any failing, it was um, a lack of modesty shall we say. <laughs> Dr. Steinman was actually a, one of the engineers that came into the area in the 1930s to investigate the possibility of building a bridge across the Straits of Mackinac. One thing that people don't realize about bridge engineers, a lot of times they don't wait to be contacted. They look on their maps and, uh, and see where bridges need to be built. The Mackinac Bridge is the crowning achievement of his career. 
and he built this bridge to withstand extreme amount of winds. Um, at the time the bridge was built, the largest or the highest recorded wind speed, I believe, was around 78 miles an hour in the Straits, and he built the bridge to withstand winds uh, exceeding 600 miles an hour. Overcompensation? Perhaps. But only 10 years earlier, the people of Washington saw firsthand how much damage an ill wind can cause. The engineers of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge had pushed the envelope, a disastrous combination of too light and too thin over such a long span. Steinman knew his creation was going to break records, but he didn't want the dubious honor of designing the longest span ever to collapse. He vowed the Mackinac Bridge would withstand not only wind and current, but the test of time as well. His vision included a robust foundation of mammoth concrete piers, supporting trusses to stiffen and stabilize the span, and special aerodynamic grating on the roadway meant to keep the bridge standing strong. When questioned by a newspaper man as to what would happen if a Great Lakes ore boat struck the bridge's main tower support, Steinman quipped, the boat will sink with a serious loss of life. Steinman believed so strongly in the project, he committed a portion of his staff to draw up blueprints on spec. The move put him on top of the very short list of potential bridge designers. Dr. Steinman deserves a lot of credit for the success of the Mackinac Bridge because of his willingness to uh, go out on the limb to draw up the plans for bidding purposes without getting any fees for that. And until we actually sold the bonds, he stood to lose a lot of money, probably a quarter of a million dollars or more, uh, so he told me. And I believe him because uh, engineers in New York City don't come cheap. Even with Steinman's elaborate plans, none of the large financial bond companies usually associated with huge public works programs were willing to take the risk. But one relatively small underwriter, the Allen Company in New York, saw a chance for profit. And on February 17, 1954, they cut a certified check guaranteed by private bonds for over $96 million. It was barely enough money to cover the proposed construction schedule, which meant the bridge needed to be finished and collecting tolls within four years. The race was on. The highest wind speed ever recorded on the Mackinac Bridge was 117 miles per hour. The Mackinac Bridge will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to the Mackinac Bridge on Modern Marvels. From its creation in 1837, Michigan had been a state divided, with both its heavily forested peninsulas separated by two of the largest lakes on Earth. But in 1954, an army of engineers, craftsmen, and builders descended on the narrow streets of Mackinac to link the state with concrete and steel. The actual construction of the Mackinac Bridge began in 1954, and they assembled the largest group of maritime construction equipment for a peacetime project that had ever been assembled in the world. For engineers, choosing the bridge site was easy. It was the shortest distance between two points. The hard part was getting it built. To stand up to the forces of nature, the bridge needed a firm footing. The design called for the construction of 33 concrete foundations, or piers, built in the water. Pier 17, one of two water anchorages for the bridge's suspension cables, was the starting point. From observation towers, engineers triangulated the pier's proper location. About a mile from shore, barge workers lowered the first of three enormous 135 by 35 by 75 foot steel frames into 88 feet of water. Because everything depended on a secure anchorage, workers used spud piles to nail the steel cage into the mud and silt of the lake bed, known as overburden.
protected framework, bridgemen pounded interlocking metal plates to create the submerged outer shell of the anchor pier. We're here at the south anchor pier of the Mackinac Bridge down near the water level. This anchor pier was constructed uh, using the cofferdam method of construction, which is a large open type structure built of sheet piling. You can see here the sheet piling that is left in place with the interlocking devices. With the interlocking metal plates driven to bedrock and completely surrounding the inner frames, the cofferdam was complete. Crane operators then removed the lake bed from inside the dam. With nothing but exposed bedrock remaining, workers began pumping in concrete. A lot of concrete. Enough to form over 10 miles of a four-lane highway. When you look at the Mackinac Bridge, 75% of it is underwater. You don't realize how big that structure really is if uh, you can see the whole thing. Once completed, the bridge's substructure would weigh in at more than 900,000 tons, dwarfing the over 100,000 ton superstructure. In spring of 1956, the underwater foundations were being finished. Pier 17's huge footing was in place, and workers started the equally enormous job of pouring the over 10-story top structure. Deep inside, builders encased the retaining hooks, or eye bars that would hold fast one end of the bridge's suspension cables. The finished product was a 180,000-ton man-made mountain used to both support and anchor the bridge. Another early challenge for designers, receding Ice Age glaciers had dug an underwater canyon in the middle of the straits. At the center, the bottom lay beneath 200 feet of water and nearly 400 feet of loose sand and mud. Though the suspension bridge would hang gracefully above the deepest part of the canyon, on either side the two 552-foot towers had to be firmly planted on bedrock. To get there, engineers designed a cutting caisson. Built from a number of massive metal rings, the caisson was created by stacking the pieces one atop the other. Once connected, it formed an open shaft to the bottom of the lake. It was 116 feet diameter, with the first section being tapered, kind of giving it a cutting edge to cut its way into the overburden, and at the same time, they would excavate material out of the center of the caisson, and it was essentially drove itself down to bedrock. Assembled on land, workers dubbed the four-story behemoths Paul Bunyan's Donuts. Despite the playful name, getting them in place was hard work. They had trouble because of the winds and the uh, current flowing through the straits area where these large caissons were, would spin like tops. For passing spectators, the sight was nearly comical. The workers, however, were being taught a tough lesson in physics. Once 300 tons begins to move, it's very difficult to stop and they used these uh, large cables connected to, to ships out there, these big freighters, in order to uh, prevent them from spinning. But they had trouble. One day they might spin one way, clockwise, and another day they might spin counterclockwise. They really didn't know. Despite their wayward behavior above the water, once submerged, the performance of the caissons was nearly perfect. As barge workers sank the massive steel structure, they added additional pieces to the top. Simultaneously, crane operators, using clamshell steam shovels, dug the overburden from inside. The increased weight and diminishing interior muck caused the caisson's tapered edge to gouge its way down to bedrock and a firm foundation. By May 6, 1955, both caissons were in place. The next step involved filling the massive hollow tubes, over the course of the project, workers pumped over 160,000 cubic yards of concrete into the two tower supports. 103,000 cubic yards were poured in just 31 days to set a new world record for underwater concrete pouring. With the foundation laid, on July 2, 1955, the U.S. Steel Corporation took on the formidable task of raising the superstructure. With its arrival, a small army of workers descended on the unsuspecting local communities. During the course of the project, over 2,500 men worked the bridge site. For the tiny town of Mackinac City, 
it was like the circus had come to town and decided to stay. When all these construction people, especially the iron workers, converged on the area, I don't think the town really knew what was going to happen. <laughs> I kind of related to an old west town when they discovered gold. Just all these people coming into the area, and uh, they were they were different. They had a different type of lifestyle than most of the regulars did. It was a change for the locals, put it that way. Uh, there were a lot of uh, businesses that kind of came with them and uh, left with them. Some of those businesses catered to the iron workers' every need and passion. There's one place in town called Lil's Fatty Hole. And they get a plate of ribs and a bath and a for three dollars. And that made their night. And they might get two or three of them. Today, some of the men who worked on the Mighty Mac periodically get together and remember their time raising the bridge. In a restaurant below the Mackinac Bridge Museum, they've assembled for drinks. The iron workers have the best record for getting in, doing the job, and getting out. The iron workers are trained to be safe, and iron workers love to be safe. And as an old saying goes, you can count the Joes by the fingers and the toes. And I think if you look around here, you'll see everybody has got all of them. Some of them's getting a little wrinkled. No, I'm not. It's good, Ed. Uh, my son is. Son's good. Son's good. Son's running for all. Them towers came in four sections, and they would, uh, as they said, them, I was in the riveting gang, so we were coming up behind them. We had a scaffold that went all the way around the outside, and we had to pull that damn thing up with hand crabs. Boy, that thing was heavy. The superstructure of the Mackinac Bridge is very similar to uh, like a, a child's erector set. The towers were constructed in a steel yard in Pennsylvania, and they actually assembled these 552 feet tall towers horizontally on the ground at Pennsylvania to make sure all the parts fit right. And then they took it all apart and brought it in by rail into St. Ignace. And from St. Ignace they uh, took everything out on uh, barges and on ships where they hoisted all the pieces uh, together. When the height became too great to reach from the water, workers constructed a special creeper derrick. Like a spider, the creeper derrick climbed the towers. Once in position, it lifted 80-ton sections of steel to gangs of men who secured the pieces level by level. This was the first ironworker job I had. We started out about 50 feet in the air, and as we went up, we went up to 552 feet. And it was quite a change from being on the ground. And you were so nervous at times, and you never really got used to it, but uh, after a while, you... you uh, I don't know what to say, how to say it. Uh, you was okay up there, I guess. <laughs> Over the next five months, bridge men toiled to lift and secure the 13,000 tons of steel that made up the two towers. On October 22nd, 1955, the top piece of the first tower was set in place. The bridge workers high above the straits decided on a fitting celebration. They stood up there, 550 feet above the water, waving a flag in a 35 mile an hour southwest wind and the flag was just whipping back and forth uh, and there they were waving with their hard hats on and it, it was amazing on that day the tower and underwater caisson comprised a structure 753 feet tall 10 full stories higher than the washington monument One milestone was beneath their work belts, but the celebration was short-lived. The bridge men knew they had another two full years of toil and bad weather ahead. The Mackinac Bridge has a capacity of 6,000 cars per hour. The Mackinac Bridge will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to the Mackinac Bridge on Modern Marvels. In 1955, construction workers on the Mackinac Straits were busy building the foundation for the bridge that would finally link Michigan's two peninsulas. While the Mackinac Bridge's mammoth anchorages and tower supports were being built, 30 additional concrete piers were under construction as well. Built to support the roadway on either side of the suspension span, crews erected the simple arch and T-shaped structures out of concrete and steel. 
Though dwarfed by the mammoth towers, the additional supports were impressive in their own right. There are 34 piers in the design of the Mackinac Bridge. Uh, some of the spans between those individual piers equals the distance of some of the largest bridges in, in the country. Some of those lengths are uh, about 500, 600 feet long between the, some of the individual piers. While construction proceeded on the water, workers on the shore began building the three miles of trestle roadway that would make up the rest of the bridge. Some of the largest trestle pieces measured 472 feet in length and weighed 720 tons. Upon completion, tugboats towed the pieces on raised barges to their proper concrete anchorages, where they were lowered into place. Throughout the bridge building process, engineers gambled with the changing weather. During construction, obviously one of the greatest difficulties is weather in the short construction season. They had a deadline, they needed revenue and they had a very short period of time to put it together. That means they pushed the construction seasons. Weather was always a factor. On November 10th, 1955, one of the region's infamous storms hammered the Straits. With winds gusting nearly 80 miles an hour, the blizzard nearly toppled one of the elevated trestles. Nine days later, the weather was finally good enough for the tugs to move the undamaged trestle into place. The day after the span was installed, the freezing winter weather returned, and the engineers were taking no more chances. Construction on the water was halted for the rest of the season. Though all work ceased on the water, throughout the winter and into the spring of 1956, iron workers remained busy. Rail cars regularly brought thousands of tons of steel. Workers prefabricated portions of the bridge on the shoreline of the frozen straits. You see the footage of them working out there in their heavy equipment and garb in the wintertime, breathing. You know it must have been freezing, by the way, that you see their breath. The amazing group of men who put that bridge together. In the spring of 1956, workers were back on the lake to begin construction on the most daring part of the job, creating the main cables. Whenever you build a suspension bridge, there are always massive cables involved with the construction. You have two cables that hold up the roadway. And those cables are made up of thousands of small cables, small wires that have to be uh, spun back and forth between the two towers. The reason they do that is because it would be impossible to run a cable of that size, that distance, at one time. To start the spinning process, iron workers strung guide wires from the anchorages over both towers. Onto these wires, they hung a safety catwalk made from timber and chain-link fence. Ironically, what was meant to protect and keep the workers safe high above the wind-churned water would instead bring terror and death. Summer in 56, they were kicking out the catwalk. I wasn't right there. I was on Pier 17 when it happened. That was about a mile from there. 500 feet above the water, a crew of workers was paying out the walkway when things went terribly wrong. The catwalk broke free from its guide wires. As their safety net disappeared from beneath their feet, two men, Jack C. Baker and Robert Copen, plummeted to their deaths. Another man was left dangling above the water, clinging to the collapsed catwalk, as stunned co-workers tried to rescue him. One guy on the tower that didn't fall, I met him and he said it was like a movie. Uh, Copen and Baker were just tumbling in the air. And then one other guy went down with them, Stetman. But what happened there, the fence, snow fence hit him as he went down and he got a hold of the snow fence and he kicked his shoes off and climbed up to the top and got back on the tower. And that was quite a climb. Remarkably, with all the inherent dangers involved in bridge construction, the death toll was unexpectedly low. Five people did lose their lives. One of the divers who was working welding on the uh, foundations, uh, his name was Frank Pepper, came up too fast and uh, died shortly afterwards of Ben's. A second man, James R. Lesarge, lost his balance working on one of the anchorages. While a third, Albert Abbott, apparently suffered a heart attack, walking a beam only a few feet above the water. 
The fall of Baker and Copen in June of 1956 marked the last fatalities the construction would see. With the safety catwalk now squarely in place, bridgemen began to spin the two main suspension cables. The operation was a race against time and nature. It wasn't a new process, but it had never been used before on such a large span. The strength of the unprotected wires could be compromised if left exposed to the elements. Two spinning wheels, complete with cowbells to alert the cable-laying bridge workers, were pulled from anchorage to anchorage over the two towers. The speed of the operation meant the workers had to stay on their toes. Just this side of Tower 20, when we were spinning the wire, that wheel run 35 miles an hour. The wind was blowing pretty good. So I grabbed the two dead wires and put them down in the wickets, which was just some hooks. I reached up to grab a live wire, and when I did, two ferals come together in that wind, and they snarled up, and she pinched me right there like that. 35 mile an hour, I went down that walkway. Lori Taylor shut the panic button off and stopped the wheel, and when I came back, I landed on the walkway. But it tore about 50% of my clothes off and tore a hip up a little bit. But I landed on the walkway instead of in the drink. So that was, that was a good experience. With each three and a quarter mile round trip, the wheels deposited eight wires and took about a half hour. Workers bound 340 individual wires to make one strand. 37 strands were combined to make one cable. Here's an actual piece of the wire that they used to string uh, to make up the two main cables of the Mackinac Bridge. They used over 12,350 strands of wire to make up the two main cables. And as you can see, it, uh, it's pretty strong stuff. It's even hard to bend. The spinning continued 24 hours a day. 300 men, 150 per side, worked 12-hour shifts, all the while engaged in a friendly competition to see who could wire the bridge fastest. When it's all done, there wasn't a dozen trips difference between the two ships. Nope. Nope. And with all the shutdowns and everything else, it came out almost even. Each ship had done the same amount of trips across it. Over the course of 78 days, the workers strung and bound 41,000 miles of steel wire to build the two 24 and a half inch diameter main bridge cables. Their next big challenge, hanging the massive steel framework to form the roadway. Almost five million rivets were used in the construction of the Mackinac Bridge. The Mackinac Bridge will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to the Mackinac Bridge on Modern Marvels. During 1956, the high-profile High Wire Act of the cable spinners mesmerized workers and spectators alike. While closer to the water, another less visible group was hard at work on the three miles of trestled roadway connecting the suspension bridge to land. By December of 1956, all but the two pieces of truss closest to the anchorages had been installed. The engineers pushed the season, hoping to finish but the weather did not cooperate. Bone-chilling wind brought winter to the straits, and once again, all work on the water was forced to stop, leaving the bridge with a strange gap-tooth appearance. The following spring, workers and engineers returned to the bridge with an uneasy sense of urgency. The completion date was slightly more than six months away, and there was still much to be done. For engineers, one of the most daunting jobs on the agenda was hanging the roadway onto the over 12,000-ton main cables. During the spring and summer of 1957, crane operators lifted 89 120 by 40-foot steel truss structures from barges anchored below the bridge. Iron workers standing 150 feet above the straits bolted the steel together and attached it to the 368 dangling wire suspender cables. If you can imagine the two towers with a cable between them, which is called a catenary, it's somewhat like a clothesline. Now, if you were to put a piece of clothes, a heavy pair of jeans, on one end of your clothesline, the other end would go up. 
And that's the problems they had in construction of the roadway trust. In one of industry's first large-scale use of computers, engineers were able to calculate the exact order in which the pieces came into alignment. Every piece was mathematically considered so that the weight put on panel point two, when it was there, that means that panel point 46 prime was ready to be installed. And they had to go through a certain sequence. They couldn't load one end up, put all your clothes on one end, and the other end is just tight. They couldn't do that. So the Mackinac Bridge actually did not look in its graceful curve during the construction. It did not look that way into the installation of the last three roadway sections. The last three truss sections were the center section and the one at each tower. By July 22nd, all but the last three pieces were in place. Crane operators hoisted the building-sized trusses up to eager gangs of iron workers. With the roadway truss finished, the main cables settled into their final resting position. Work crews coated the bundled wires in red lead paste, and then using a motorized wrapping machine, wound them in a final galvanized steel sheath. The last step in completing the bridge was laying the roadway. First, workers maneuvered and then secured giant steel stringers to the top of the truss. For aerodynamics and to lessen the weight, engineers installed a steel grate surface atop the stringers. During October of 1957, bridge workers made over one million welds to secure the grate. As the steel deck was being placed, a small army of pavers spread 6,660 tons of concrete to form the four-lane road surface, including the two outer lanes on the suspension span. And they used lightweight concrete instead of the regular concrete and also lightweight uh, asphalt uh, because it was a bridge and they wanted to make sure it was aerodynamic. Finally, after four years, on November 1st, 1957, at a cost of $100 million, the bridge opened to traffic. Prentice M. Brown and Michigan's governor, G. Menon Williams, were among dignitaries in the first car to cross. But like everybody else, they had to pay the $3.25 toll. Fanfare and fireworks marked the event. But fearing the unpredictable November weather, the bridge authority scheduled the official opening festivities to be held in the warmth and calm of the following June. On that sunny November day, the people of Michigan realized they had to wait another six months for the real celebration to begin. But when that day came, the weather had one more surprise. It was a miserable, miserable day. The weather was so bad. Floats were <laughs> destroyed. Uh, but, you know, it didn't dampen the spirits of the participants. They uh, just waited until the weather cleared. They marched, they smiled, the bands played. It was a great, wonderful day, and it went on for the next six days. For years, bridge workers and engineers had endured everything that nature could throw at them. In the end, it seemed somehow fitting that bad weather returned for one last appearance. But on time and on budget, the builders had created something that no amount of wind or current could destroy. Now it fell to future bridge workers to make sure it stayed that way. wire rope, which originally supported the safety catwalk, was recycled, cut into lengths, and fashioned into the suspender cables that today connect the roadway to the main cables. The Mackinac Bridge will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to the Mackinac Bridge on Modern Marvels. The engineers who built the Mighty Mac boasted that it would last a thousand years. That's possible, according to the Mackinac Bridge Authority, whose job it is to keep the bridge up and running. Sixty full-time workers are charged with everything from minor painting to changing the lights on the towers. During the winter, almost all maintenance work is halted. But with each spring, an army of workers converges on the bridge. 
Larger projects are contracted out to construction firms. In 1992, a new road surface was installed. And later that decade, the tower elevators, which hoist workers to the top, were replaced. Today, it's the road surface receiving some well-deserved attention. Below me here is a section of open grading that was originally placed in 1957. It's steel grading about five inches thick. It's been painted and blasted several times in its lifespan. As part of our annual inspection, we locate uh, different sections of grading that we'd like to replace and have a continuous program of replacement where we're replacing these sections with galvanized open grading. In 1996, the Bridge Authority appropriated over $70 million to paint the five-mile structure. What has happened is we have so many coatings of paint on the bridge. It's like the old dresser in your family. You can paint it, you can varnish it, you can varnish it, you can paint it, you can varnish it. Pretty soon, you have to zip strip, take all the coatings off, and just start over. And that's where we're at right now with the Mackinac Bridge. It's probably the most important project we have going. The painting process will take workers 12 full years and isn't expected to be finished until the year 2013. But the Bridge Authority has a future plan on the books that makes the paint project look modest. We have a plan in the year 2017 to start replacing the bridge deck itself. And uh, even though that's quite a ways off, it's a very large uh, dollar construction project. It's estimated at just under $300 million. A deck historically has a life of about 50 years. We expect to get 60 years or maybe a little better out of ours. It doesn't mean that the deck is going to fall in the lake after 50 years. It means one of two things. One is that it has deteriorated to the point where load restrictions had to be put on, or it has deteriorated to the point where maintenance is just too severe. It's costing too much money to maintain. When it costs so much money to maintain, it's time to replace it and start over with that new deck that you have to put no money into for another 30 years or 40 years. The bridge's need for a little TLC hasn't cooled the public's opinion of their state icon. Neither has the fact that its record as the longest suspension bridge has since been surpassed. Where it stands today, it is the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Two other bridges opened in 1998, the Akashi in Japan and the Great Belt in Denmark. Putting that aside, the Mackinac Bridge stood for all these years as the longest suspension bridge in the world. It is truly an engineering marvel. The public agrees. And once a year, people from around the world get an up-close opportunity to show their appreciation. Every Labor Day for the past 45 years, traffic on the bridge slows to a walk. During our Labor Day walk, it's the only time that we allow pedestrians on the bridge, so it gives you a unique opportunity to take in the local scenery, look at the Straits of Mackinac, take a leisurely walk across the bridge, uh, view Mackinac Island, view Mackinac City. You said, Ignis, I can't think of anything that's more scenic than the walk across the bridge. 65,000 pedestrians take part in the Mackinac Bridge Walk, which allows the public to come face to foot with the symbol of their state and one of the greatest engineering feats of the 20th century. Those skeptics who threw out all those reasons why we shouldn't build it were wrong. And the last four, four and a half decades have proved it. And it's benefited so many people in the state of Michigan and all over the United States. It's something out of the past I'm still living with. I'm proud to be part of it. I'm proud to be part of the men that built the bridge. And I think it's an honor to be Iron River and worked on the Mackinac Bridge. Squirt it, slather it, lay it on thick. So maybe glue.